So Claire, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. This is super exciting. Uh, maybe you can start just by sharing with people where you are in, in the world and a little bit about how you got into this crazy sleep apnea part of dentistry. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I tell you what, I'll start with my story because it's a bit of an unconventional story. So when I was in general practice, I went to an aesthetic convention and I bumped into a dentist who was in the year above me at dental school and I said to her, what are you up to? And she said those three words, dental sleep medicine. And genuinely, I had no idea what she was talking about. We had never been taught this concept at dental school right and I sort of just smiled asked a few questions but I didn't want to embarrass myself too much <laughs> but the rest of that convention I felt very distracted it was sort of just playing on my mind just to, just to explain so so dentists here in America aren't really taught anything about sleep apnea or dental sleep medicine as part of their normal general dentistry training is yes. it the same in the UK exactly the same which okay. is shocking when you actually think about it <laughs> And so I came home, I sort of said hi briefly to my husband, ran up to the office, locked myself in, and I Googled dental sleep medicine. And it was literally, you know, people talk about a core memory, something that you just will remember forever. And it was genuinely one of those moments. I felt like a light bulb had gone off next to me. And I thought, oh my gosh, how is there this whole area of dentistry that I had no idea about? You know, it's been around and I'm just not part of it. I have to be part of this. I have to learn this. And then I thought, well, how do I learn this? You know, so I quickly Googled for courses and there was one starting three weeks after. And it was actually being taught by one of my old teachers from dental school. It had her mobile number on it. And I called up the number. I said, it's me. It's Claire. I want to learn and come on the course. And she said to me, you're not coming on this course. I said, what do you mean? And she said, it's a masterclass. It's for people who have done cases before and you've got no experience. You've never done a case. You'll be out of your death depth you're not coming on it but I don't take no for an answer and after half an hour on the phone I forced my way on this course and she was right I went on the course I was totally out of my depth I had no idea what was going on but I learned enough information to get myself going to start you know with a patient when I came out oh. my first patient was my husband because I thought before I start saving other marriages I'll, I'll focus <laughs> on my own deal with my snorer first so tell us what was going on with your husband's sleep and his snoring well, his sleep was perfect. He was having a lovely night's sleep. Like, I didn't think he was apneic. He wasn't stopping breathing. Mm -hmm. But his snoring, you know, it was driving me mad. I was sleeping with earplugs. Or we had this thing where I would have to fall asleep first before him. And, you know, sometimes when you have something on your mind, you know, you get a bit anxious and you have those nights where it's difficult falling asleep. Those nights, the snoring would just it was just too much you know I'd be nudging yeah. him to sleep on his side and as soon as I made him a device it was just transformative for his sleep actually and my sleep so I started doing some more cases and my love for general dentistry was going down and down I just knew I wanted to do dental sleep medicine but there isn't really this dental sleep medicine market I guess in the UK is it, still so new it's not like there are dental sleep medicine jobs that I could switch to it just didn't right. exist right but I set up something called the London Dental Sleep Clinic I sort of branded it like that while I was working you know, alongside being a, a general dentist and then last year I went on a course it was an occlusion course just to get my basic knowledge up a level just on how teeth meet etc and we we're going around the room and there were 18 dentists on this course. And the course consultant, he was asking everyone why they're on this course. And they were all like, oh, you know, I'm this dentist. I want to take on complex toothwear cases and this, that, the other. And it got round to me and I said, I don't want to do any of this. I do dental sleep medicine. I just want to make sure my basic knowledge is good enough. And he pointed to me and he said, you. Next week, so it was a three day course. Next week, you're going to do a talk on dental sleep medicine and what you do to everyone in the group. So I thought, oh my gosh, this is my moment. So yeah. that next week came, I stood up and I did my talk. And he was sitting in the audience and he looked at me. He didn't even properly know my name. He looked at me, he goes, You, now you're going to run courses for us on dental sleep medicine. And that was on the Friday. And on the Monday morning at 8 30 in the morning, I quit my job. I thought if someone could believe in me, 
Yeah. Just like that, without knowing me, even if the course never happened, because people say things, you never know if they're genuine. I thought, this is it. I've got to believe in myself. I'm not going to live my life with regrets. I'm going to work it out somehow. And that was it. And I sent him a text to say, without being too dramatic, your course has kind of changed my life. I've just quit my job with nothing lined up. And I got a text message back with some exclamation marks. I think maybe a few expletives in there. Like, oh, my God, what have you done? <laughs> and that was it. And and he said, we need to have a chat. And we had a chat. And he very kindly offered me a job at his practice to run my sleep clinic. And I got a job in central London as well. I sort of created this position. And also another one in North London. And that's it. I've just had to try and work from the ground up to try and create yeah. something. Yeah. So let's go back and just for people listening who maybe just have never heard of this before, if they've listened for a long time, they're probably like almost expert at what these things are. But for anybody who's just listening to this for the first time, can you explain like why a dentist would be involved with sleep apnea at all? Like what what kind of appliances or devices we're talking about? Like what exactly they do? So dentists can be involved in many ways and it can be from just screening you for sleep apnea to going all the way to what I do. The first thing is dentists see so many people and so many patients, unlike you know, with GPs or well, here in the UK anyway, we only go to a doctor and if there's a problem. You don't right. just go for a random checkup, but right. people go to their dentists regularly for checkups. And we're very well placed to screen patients for snoring and for sleep apnea. So that's the first thing. And that's what I'm really passionate about as well as educating other dentists to do this. Even if you screen as a dentist and then refer them on to a GP or someone like myself, that's amazing. And then if dentists are more into dental sleep medicine, we can make something called mandibular advancement devices. And they're basically like these little aligners, these trays that position the lower jaw forwards. And by positioning the lower jaw forwards, you open up the airway to help improve airflow, sort of reduce that obstruction. And that will help get rid of that snoring sound or reduce it anyway and reduce any apneas that you might have. It's not effective on 100% of people. I wish it was, but it's pretty effective. And especially for patients who don't want to wear CPAP machine. I'd say we're next in line for patients to try something out. And would you say in the UK you have similar challenges in terms of a lot of people being diagnosed and prescribed CPAP, but then struggling with it and having a tough time? Yeah, absolutely. The compliance rate is poor. Um, most of my patients who have sleep apnea are ones who have failed on CPAP, who just don't want to wear it, particularly if they're young. Mm-hmm. They just they just don't want to be wearing it at all. But the reality is it's cheap for the NHS to give patients CPAP. There are some hospitals that provide mandibular advancement devices, but it's not cost effective for them. And that's the biggest challenge. Mm. Maybe I have this like rose tinted view of what's going on in the UK and you can set me straight. There was a change to the NICE guidelines, which included... Um, mandibular advancement devices can you share with us a little bit about that and why that matters and how that's so in, kind of gone into practice so in august 2021 the guidelines changed and it officially put dentists on the map in yeah. terms of the management of sleep apnea so that was obviously a, a big a big thing yeah. Yeah. right and so what do you do when you make a customizable device so for us we did digit- well i use digital scanners in my practice you don't have to, you can still use the impressions, but nowadays most people digitally Mm -hmm. scan. That gives us a really accurate image of your teeth to get a fully bespoke device that's going to be fitted to your mouth. And also what's really important is setting the bite. Where's our first position? We all have a range of motion from biting normally to moving our lower jaw forwards, okay? And we're obviously not going to push you 100% forwards. You'd never tolerate that. And the evidence shows there's no need to go that far forwards. But during my assessment with my patients, I set the position that I want to set that patient at. And but that's not necessarily going to be their end position, for example, but that will make it a fully customizable device. And then I can gradually titrate and move that patient forwards Mm -hmm. to help open up their bite. And then do you do follow up sleep studies as well? Yeah, we do follow up sleep studies to 
I like to have data. I like to know that what I'm doing is working. And obviously we can do that based on their symptoms, but I really want to validate that. And the only real way we can do that is with sleep testing after. Are most of your patients paying out of pocket? Like are they going, are any people able to go through the NHS at the moment or no? Yes, if they get referred by their GP to the hospitals. Okay. Some of the hospitals are offering these devices. But the patients that I see, it's not out in general practice on the NHS. Yeah, so everyone I see is private. Okay. We hope that will change in time. Yeah. Know, people are working really hard behind the scenes to try and help. But it's not easy. There's just such shortage yeah, of money I mean, on the NHS. I mean, it's, it's not easy here. And we have a, you know, like you would think with our insurance system, it would be easier. Like you can get mandibular advancement devices covered by medical insurance here in the United States but it's it seems like there are a lot of hurdles <laughs> between yeah, yeah. people wanting to do that and actually getting it covered are there any particular things that you've seen in your practice which can give us a general idea of like who does well with the mandibular advancement device and who doesn't or does it just do you just have to try it and see I think there are some patients to be honest, who are so desperate, they want it to work and they're really willing to try it. There are some who have been dragged in, <laughs> who you can already see. It's not that it wouldn't work on them, but there's just a reluctance for them to even want yeah. to wear anything. And yeah. that's the biggest problem if you're dealing with maybe snorer or mild apneics who don't really have that many symptoms. They don't want to wear anything. It's not bothering them that much. It's bothering their partner. So it's yeah. just trying to, to encourage them to do that. Obviously, patients who've got really bad gum disease, we can't be making them a mandibular advancement device. We want to also patients who are more severely apneic, their first line treatment will still be a CPAP machine. Yeah. And they should still be having a trial of that first. Mm -hmm. So if they fail that or they don't want a CPAP and we step in and make a mandibular advancement device, hopefully it will work, but it might not work to the same level right. as if they were more mildly apneic. Right. Do you do at home testing or do you, how do you do the testing part of it? Yeah, because I understand in America when certain states dentists can give at home testing, can't they? But not all of them. But not all of them. Yeah, there's like, yes. I think there's two holdouts. <laughs> yes, and I feel really lucky here in the UK that we can give sleep tests. Sleep tests. I can't understand why in America right. you wouldn't be able to. I'm literally just handing them the test. Yes. And I work with a sleep physician who yes. analyzes it and I just tell them the results. I, I don't understand why there's this reluctance right. to do it because right. as dentists, we're not allowed to report on the sleep studies. So you yes. must make sure in the UK you're working with a physiologist or a sleep physician to report to on it. To actually make the diagnosis if there's one to yes. be made. Yes. yes. You know, I'm not claiming I can make a diagnosis. Definitely not. As dentists, yeah. we can only screen. Um, but it, it just makes a pathway for the patient so much slicker. Yeah. And that's what we've got to do is improve their patient pathway, improve our flow as well. Yeah. But I can literally assess the patient, give them the sleep study and get the data back in the next day and get the report, you know, yeah. back a, a day or two later. And it's yeah. done. Do you think that that's easing the way a little bit? Like I find one of the big issues with sleep apnea is people being reluctant to get tested in the first place. Like I talked to a lot of people who were like, I don't want to do CPAP. I have all the symptoms but I'm just not going to test because almost like denial, like they don't want to know. Like, do you find that the home testing that they're able to do right away, is it, is it all home testing there or? No, I mean, I don't obviously prescribe a, a lab sleep right. study, yeah. but that does exist. Of course it does, for, but it's more maybe for the more severe sleep yeah. disorders. It's really yeah. expensive to do as yeah. you know, and they do offer it on the NHS and you can get it done privately as well. Yeah. But the nice guidelines for sleep apnea, say home sleep studies are enough. They've right. come along so, so much that, yeah. you know, the results in, in how well they perform is almost comparable to cool. the lab sleep study. So yeah, and I find with my patients that actually it's the opposite of what you say. They want the sleep studies there. Oh. We're so obsessed, I feel, with data, particularly since COVID. You know, they come in with sleep tra tracking apps and I don't know, I find the patients I see, maybe they're a bit more obsessed with it because they think they know there's a problem. Yeah. You know, it's not just a random yeah. member of the public. That's great. And 
yeah so they, they want to know what's going on yeah but what they don't want is if there is a diagnosis of sleep apnea they don't want me writing to the gp because they're worried it will affect their insurance ah. that's where the sticking point is okay so many patients because obviously if i get a diagnosis from my sleep physician I work with and I say right I'd like to write to your GP just to inform them of everything and they say no please don't write to the GP you mean life insurance yeah they don't want it on their GP's record yes because oh I can't tell you how many patients say that and obviously I can't I you can't go behind their back and write to their GP. Of course, it's within patients' right to say no. Please don't, please don't pass that information on. But a lot of them don't want it going to their GPs. It was really eye-opening. Mm. Literally, never heard of that. Yeah, maybe yeah. it's just people that I deal with. Maybe <laughs> I, don't I don't know. We've talked before about this need for there to be an interdisciplinary team when people are have sleep apnea and they're seeing all different specialists so how often of the time are you just seeing a patient making them a mandibular advancement device and that's all we're doing versus are you involved with like more complicated cases where people maybe need CPAP as well or need to be referred to ENTs or different people how does that look so it's a total mishmash if I'm being honest yeah if they're coming to me and it's just snoring then they're often just, you know, they're just managed by myself yeah. or sort of more mildly apneic. If there's more to it, then that's when I'll be involving ENTs or respiratory physicians. Often patients will be referred to me as well, the other way around. So they've right. already seen the respiratory right. physician or the ENT and they've been assessed and then referred to me. And those are actually my favorite patients because I'm, I like the doctor's involvement. I can't do this by myself. I like to be part of an MDT. It gives me comfort as a dentist that I know I'm doing the right thing for my patients. But also when I assess my patients, so many times you see them, they've got big tonsils or a long uvula or there's a problem with their nose. So more often than not, I'm already referring them on to an ENT or respiratory physician or whoever is appropriate to assess them as well but I definitely don't like working in isolation I think it's so important to work as part of an MDT because that's Mm -hmm. the only way you're going to get the best treatment outcome for your patient did that just come naturally to you you just started making friends with doctors or how did you go about that (laughs) it's I'll be honest it's taken time you know doctors have to know they can trust you Mm -hmm. that you're not just doing it because you're a greedy dentist and you're trying to treat these patients and take them away from, you know, the other physician, that you're going to see them and refer them back and want to, you're trying to do the best you can for the patients. I think the most important thing for me was getting in front of these people. It's all very well sending them a message, but you've got to follow it up and try and go out for a coffee or go out for a drink with them and meet them and build up that relationship. And that has taken time. That has not come overnight. Um, but I'd say that's one of my own personal strengths that I like being with other yeah. people and meeting them. And, you know, I've I've been to other places where it was just me working and I just felt so lonely. I have to be around a team yeah. and I want to know that I can pick up the phone and discuss a case, you know, with whoever it is and, and so yeah. try and get the best outcome for my patients. That's awesome. How, how much do you think, do you think that awareness of sleep apnea, like among the general public in the UK is increasing? What do you think about that? I think there's more initiatives that I'm seeing in the press. You know, they've done Stop Snoring Week recently and this yeah. and that. And I think since Biden got diagnosed with sleep, oh, he came out with it. There's been a lot more interest in sleep. And again, since COVID, I feel, you know, I, I can't go a week without seeing an article in a newspaper yeah. about snoring or sleep apnea or a gadget. So I think it's gradually getting there. But I do think there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, the last time I looked, it was 85% of people with sleep apnea walk around undiagnosed and unmanaged. Yeah. Or they think it's just snoring. It's nothing else. You know, I don't need to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. Or they just ignore ignore it. And the trouble is because it's not so accessible to everyone. You know, I work privately. You know, they've got to be able to, to afford it or they have to wait on the NHS. and. Mm-hmm. Tell me about putting yourself out there on social media and becoming kind of like, you know, I mean, famous in my world. Did did you just see a need that 
people needed to be educated about the symptoms of sleep apnea and know that there are options available or, or tell me a little bit about that because I yeah, feel like I think... there's a lot of dentists where their social media is like not them it's just like you know infographics and stuff so yes. it's nice to actually see your face <laughs> well I have to say the social media side I feel like I've got to do it do I enjoy it not really I've gotten over the I don't get embarrassed by it or I'm worried what other people will think I'm over that that stage but I feel like I have responsibility sort of twofold here one is to educate other dentists as well to say hey look what you can be doing look what service you can be doing to your patients you know I think so often as dentists we're so focused on we've got to the amalgam or, or probably not in America they don't do silver fillings out there you know that <laughs> composite on that you know upper left tooth or that extraction that we don't take a step back and look at our patients from a holistic point of view mm -hmm. and when you realize what a difference you can make to your patients even by screening them and referring them on to someone like you can make such a difference to patients lives so I feel I've got a duty always to help educate other dentists yeah. but then of course getting other members of the public to to think hey I do snore and actually yeah I am tired in the day I might have morning headaches and I do need an afternoon nap and then to actually not ignore those symptoms and think about getting yourself assessed and checked and yeah. I don't feel there's really anyone or very few people who do that on the internet there's just not many right. people right and I wish I could gain access to more people yeah you know well I think you will over time you'll just keep growing I'm just super interested in stereotypes around sleep apnea and this idea that like it's only older overweight men that ever have mm. sleep apnea and so part of what I do with my podcast is try and just shatter that and like shine a light on on other people who also deal with sleep apnea and don't look like that have you been surprised by the range of different people you've seen since you started yeah, in dental sleep absolutely medicine. absolutely you have this stereotype as you say in your head of that fat you know male 50 year old or whatever it is yeah. but that's totally so far from the truth I mean obviously we do know obesity is linked um with sleep apnea but I see people of all shapes all sizes all sex you know yeah. male female whatever all ages I've seen yeah. patients as young as in their 20s to older who have it and you can't judge you know or I've been surprised I saw a patient who I didn't think really had any sleep apnea I thought potentially is a snorer but I said let's do a sleep study and came back as moderate sleep apnea yeah. and it can really take you by surprise you know mainly the women I see there mm -hmm. were sort of perimenopausal yeah upwards I don't see younger females I say I start to see them in their 40s upwards interesting that's when they're noticing it but the males I definitely see from a younger age as I said mm -hmm. as young as in their 20s mm -hmm. I had someone with severe sleep apnea who couldn't get on with the CPAP was actually getting all marks all on their face yeah was very conscious of it and we've made a mandibular advancement device because he just couldn't wear a CPAP anymore so you know there's a whole range of people that I'm seeing yeah yeah me too <laughs> all the time do you actually do training for other dentists or or are you you do as well as like yes. all of the work you do and you're wow you're really busy yes so you have crazy. yes I have my three children as well but yeah no I do I teach other dentists I run courses I'm on the board for the British Society of Dental Sleep Medicine I just did a course actually on Friday we trained up 15 dentists we try and, and do courses to yeah. educate other dentists and get them going so that they can do what I can do yeah. you know we where are we at in the UK in terms of you said that that mandibular advancement devices are available in some hospitals mm -hmm. but as far as as like the coverage of the whole country do you have a similar thing to what we have here where the closer to like large populations you are you can find pretty much anything but you get more rural and there's less access do you think it's kind of yes. similar to that yeah I think it's really hard in rural areas to gain yeah. access to it like I know for sure in London where I am you can get mandibular advancement devices in the hospitals I'm sure in some of the other big cities you yes. can as well but yeah if you're in the rural areas just even access to these sleep specialists yeah. that just aren't the sleep centers but I think that will change I do too yeah you know the more we talk about it for sure so listen exactly. tell everybody where they can find you 
So you can find me online at the London Dental Sleep Clinic dot com. And I am based. Yes, I am based in central London and Harley Street in North London in Southgate and also in Middlesex in Stanmore. Wow. So you go so different places on different days? Go to different places on different I will go wherever there's a patient. It's right. not a problem. I will travel as long as it's within <laughs> reason to go and help anyone. That's I really awesome. don't mind. So anything else I didn't ask you that you want to share with everybody? No, I think you are just fabulous. And I love the fact that you put yourself out there like this because it's people like you who make such a difference and raise such awareness to sleep apnea. And it's just been such a pleasure. And thank you so much for even inviting me on. It's really so lovely. Yay. Well, my pleasure. 